This video tutorial will look at the ratio analysis techniques that are used to measure financial efficiency. So the ratios we're looking at here are actually the middle four on page two of the Buzz 3 paper. So asset turnover, inventory or stock turnover, payables, creditors days, or receivables, debt of days. So if ever you're asked to look at the efficiency ratios and often you're specified which ratios to look at, it's the middle four here. So what is financial efficiency? Well essentially, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it, but really it's a big focus on the management and how well a business is being run. So essentially, how hard is the money that's been invested into business working and performing to produce outcomes? Sometimes it's referred to how well the pounds invested are sweating, so how hard are they working? You could also think of it as money in the business being the soldiers. We want to keep as much in as possible, to make the business fighting fit and we also want them to be working hard. So financial efficiency is about how well money in the business is working. So the first of the ratios is asset turnover. And let's think of an example first about what this might mean. So here's two businesses that specialise in providing food. Our first business is a takeaway van. Now it could generate sales of £2,000. That seems pretty good. What about our restaurant? Well, our restaurant's got net assets of £10,000 the same period, and sales, which are far higher, at £7,500. In fact, sales are more than three times the amount that we had from our burger van. Now, the difference, though, is actually comparing the revenue from actually the assets that have been employed. If we think about it, the pound that we've employed, shown here with the hands, has actually managed to generate £2 for every pound that we've actually put into the business. So sales revenue was £2,000, net assets of £1,000. That's pretty good, it's a twofold return if you like. So we think about this very crudely at this stage. Our restaurant, however, for every pound we've invested, our ten thousand pounds, has only actually generated three quarters of a pound. So ten thousand generates seven thousand five hundred. So we can see that asset turnover is actually better from our burger van. If we scale them up, ten thousand pounds in both, ten thousand pounds in the burger van, so ten van, should produce, all other things being equal, sales revenue of twenty thousand which is obviously far better than the 7500 from our cafe. So asset turnover is comparing what assets we put in and the sales that are produced from this. So let's have a look at big business. So if we look here at the set of accounts we have on the right hand side, we've got the information we need to calculate asset turnover. And all we're comparing is the revenue from the business, that of sales, so profits not being considered here, and the net assets that are actually being employed. So we can see that for big business, that our revenue is £185 million and the net assets are £167 million. You can see this is green figures. So the calculation would give us a result of 1.11 times. So this would mean that for every pound invested, we've actually generated sales revenue of £1.11. Why is this useful? How is this useful? We well, need to compare it to other things in the exam. So perhaps previous performance, perhaps targets or maybe even industry averages to see whether we're performing better or worse. The higher this number, obviously the better. So what can we interpret from this? Well, the higher the values we've mentioned, the better. It means essentially there's more output given relative to lower inputs. The less a business has to spend to produce outputs, the better, or if we can increase the outputs from any given level of input. This is good, it's efficient, we're getting better returns. The nature of the business is important. Do you think about it, a window cleaner might only perhaps need to buy a van, a ladder, a bucket and some cleaning equipment. And therefore the assets would be much lower than perhaps a hotel. Even though the hotel would expect higher revenues, the window cleaner's probably got a better asset turnover because the sheer value of sales revenue is likely to be far higher. How do we improve it? So this is perhaps a suggestion if you're looking at this on question four or well, perhaps better utilising our assets, so maybe trying to get more efficiency from them, better training for staff to get more from them when they're using machinery, or perhaps removing assets which no longer have much use to them. Our second measure is stock turnover, inventory turnover. What this is looking at is how quickly a business is able to clear the stock that's holding. Again, the nature of the business is very important here. The car business that you can see the picture of on the right probably only actually sells cars perhaps one or two a day, else it will depend. 
but the value of those sales can be far higher, so it might generate the same profit as another business, but the cars don't move that quickly. They wouldn't expect to have a showroom full of cars and sell out on that day. A business selling bread, however, a small bakery, would expect to sell out. Bread is a product which is perishable, so therefore it will go off at the end of the day, and so therefore they need to shift it. So they expect to their inventory, their stock turnover, to at least once a day to get rid of stock. So this is something to bear in mind, it's very important when you come to consider and analyse this in context. So let's consider the inventory turnover for big business. Now the figures we're going to look at are highlighted in blue on the right hand side of the page. Remember this might come in one of our appendices. The inventory value is £80 million and the cost of sales is £90 million. We're actually going to reverse those figures but into our formulas. The cost of sales will be on top and the average inventory is held is on the bottom. Now the average assumes that the date of the balance sheet, that was a pretty typical amount of stock was being held. So we substitute numbers in, 90 million divided by 80 million. Don't forget, don't put all those zeros for millions, just simplify it, it adds more errors into your calculation. The answer that gives us is 1.13 times. So this means the business effectively replaces its entire stock 1.13 times over the course of a year. So let's interpret this, what does it actually mean? Well, inventory turnover, remember, tells us how quickly stock is used up and replaced. How often, over the course of a year, we're replacing our average stock. So there's opportunity costs tied into this. The more stock we hold, obviously that's more money that's tied up in it. It will vary. For some businesses, such as those that carry fast-moving consumer goods, so things like bread and milk, that move very, very quickly, we'd like to see a very high figure. These are items that move very quickly. They're replaced, perhaps even daily or weekly. Remember, a weekly figure would be 52 times a year, six monthly, twice a year. These are low profit items, but we're not really that concerned about profit at this stage. Other businesses might see that the figure's much lower, perhaps less than one. A business selling rare records may take over a year to sell one item. It may be very specialist, and they need just the right buyer to come along to purchase it. They might make quite a significant profit margin on it, so they're prepared to wait. The amount of stock they hold means that they are generating enough profit to survive. However, if that's not the case, maybe think about whether some of the stock's getting old or obsolete. A phone shop holding lots of old mobile phones, obviously new replacements come out six monthly, if not more frequently, who are sat on lots of stock, it's like to go out of date, we might have to sell it for a much lower price, so that's loss essentially we could be incurring, or it might just not sell at all. Another idea of our butcher, Anyone selling as fast moving goods, it should be shifting quite quickly. However, if it's too low a level of stock, we may find we sell out. So there's an opportunity there we could dissatisfy customers. So getting stock right is important. Again, compare to the case study, think about the type of business, the nature of the product, and maybe some facts and figures about previous performance, other competitors, or any other targets we can set. How to improve it? Reducing stock levels. Moving perhaps from high levels of stock to just in time frees up a lot of that opportunity cost. It means stock's not set up for a long time, it's going to be more up to date, and certainly if it's perishable goods, the dates on those products are going to be far longer, which obviously is a marketing advantage. So let's move on to the final pair that I'm going to put together here of ratios, which are receivables and payables days. I'll just remind you about these two, what do they actually mean? Well, receivables and payables link into our debtors and our creditors. Debtors are our customers, essentially. They buy items from us and pay us later. And creditors are our suppliers, the providers of items, and we pay them later. So to illustrate that, our creditors will provide us with our raw materials, and our debtors will buy those finished goods. So you can see the direction they're moving into and out of our business. The cash, however, moves in the opposite direction. So debtors will give us money, but not necessarily straight away, so the money's not in our hand. And the creditors we will pay, but at the moment the money's still in hand, we haven't paid them. What make them, makes them debtors and creditors is the credit facility that we allow them. Now, a key thing to think about here is the timing of these payments. If we get money in from our debtors before we have to pay our creditors, our business has got better cash flow, so this example would be a pound better off. If, however, we're actually paying money out before we receive it, then the business is going to have cash flow problems potentially, and obviously we're taking money out of the business that we could be using. 
Let's have a look at receivables days first of all. So our debtor days, this is to do with our customers. So the figures we're looking at are receivables, debtors, 30 million in this example, and revenue, our turnover, 185 million. We're trying to find out how long an average customers are taking to pay us. So our formula would be receivables divided by our revenue multiplied by 365 days in this example. So 30 divided by 185 multiplied by 365 would lead to 59.2, and that's days. So this means that the business takes or allows customers 59.2 days to pay their debts. That's about two months. Uh, business often trade in 30, 60, 90 days of credit. However, look at the case study for exact information. Let's have a look at our payables days, our creditors. So this is how long it takes us to pay for our debts. So first of all, the figures we're looking after are shown in red. Now often our payables are shown in just our current liabilities. And I might say including payables. So we can assume that full amount would be that payables figure. And our cost of sales, in this case, is 90 million. Ignore the negative 105 here. That's just showing the fact this money that's owed. We're looking at the whole absolute number, so 105 million. So putting that into our formula, 105 divided by 90, again, multiplied by 365 days, actually leads to 425.9 days. That's a very long time. It's actually about a year and a third. And we can see this because our sales are £90 million pounds worth of stock. We actually owe £105 million. So we can tell over the course of a year that we owe more than we actually sell. So this means the business takes 426 days to pay its debt. So let's interpret what the payables and receivables days mean for us. Well, first of all, let's think about those debtor days. So this is how long it takes us to get money from our customers. A lower figure is preferred. It does mean that we can get money quicker. We may offer discounts uh, for early payment. However, it could be a marketing advantage not to. A lot of high street furniture stores, as the example here comes from, will actually offer us four years, for example, interest-free credit. Well, that could be... Great, good marketing advantage, but could cause cash flow problems. The business must be aware of that. Our creditors? Well, these are the people who are supplying us our goods. They're our lifeline in terms of that. So, we could improve our liquidity problems by delaying those payments, but we might have to pay interest. And as the steaming supplier here shows, we could actually end up endangering our relationship with our suppliers. Remember the partnership approach from AF. This flies in the face of that. So, very quickly there you have an idea, hopefully now, of what the efficiency ratios are and what they mean.